read me romance read read me romance read me romance read read me romance you could take a look in a book that's fine or you could sit back relax and unwind and read me romance read read me romance welcome back lady listeners hey everybody welcome back to another week at read me romance we have got Abby Knox this week with us, and she's brought us a book called Roadside Attraction, and it's cute as fuck. Most of her stuff is like, that's how I would describe most of her books, cute as fuck. Yeah, definitely. Best too. She lives in my town with me. Welcome back to Read Me Romance. Hey, lady listeners. Welcome to another week. <laughs> Good game show. Ooh. I don't know why I automatically do that voice, but hey, you're here. Thanks for joining us. We've got Am Johnson this week, who is a darling, by the way. So incredibly adorable via email because we haven't met person. <laughs> <laughs> what if she's a bitch? <laughs> you never know. You know, you meet so many people online. Mm-hmm. You're always, you know, sometimes yeah. you really do have a great rapport with some people online and then you meet mm-hmm. them and there's not that yeah. click. And then sometimes you meet people and it's just like, Wham, it just goes to tell you that chemistry is so fucking real. It's so true. Yes, it's a real thing. Man, so she's here today. She's brought us a book into Elysium, which is like super cool because it's like this awesome, like futuristic dystopian book. And so, and we haven't had something like that on the podcast before. So, this is really different and it's sort of outside of her box on her books that she's written before. So, it's just so awesome, like like pulling up stuff and pulling up her books and bios and all that for this. I was like, this is great. I love it because it feels like it feels like we're flexing a new muscle without actually working out. Nice. So. <laughs> so I'll start with I'm exhausted because, and I said I'd tell you when we were recording. So Kevin and I started watching the show, and I don't know how I got roped into it because it's um, – it's a show that it, I think it's called the squid or something okay. squid game. I think it's called squid game. So it's a, a, it was filmed in Korea. It's a Korean film. They speak it. And so the, it's actually like uh, subtitles and it's dubbed over. So when they speak and their mouths don't move correctly, but it's in English. So That's anyways. so weird. I had to look back at my phone because literally somebody just texted about this show like an hour ago. Are you serious? Yeah. Oh, wow. It's so good. It's really fucked up, but it's really good. So I would suggest there's a setting on Netflix that you can go into. I hate dubbed whenever like someone's speaking English over someone speaking Korean or speaking Spanish. Like instead of you hearing them speak Spanish and reading English subtitles, you're reading English subtitles while they're speaking English, but their mouths don't match. And that annoys oh, the shit yeah, out of yeah, yeah, yeah. So I go in and I turn the dubbed off and I just make it whatever language they're speaking. And I just read the subtitles. I feel like that's way easier because yeah. sometimes the dubbed doesn't match with the words. But it's a very interesting concept. And to just boil it down to as, as little a storyline as possible. These people are really hard up for money. They owe a ton of debt. Like it's just people in really shitty situations where they need a lot of money. And so they go into this like program in order to like win this money basically, but it's, it's games and it's to the death. And it is so interesting because it's all about like the dynamics with people and relationships and alliances and how people manipulate and there's good twists and turns. And it's like a couple of people know each other from childhood and there's like, this whole range of people from all different classes. And it's just, it's a really fascinating show. If you're interested in something like that at all, I totally recommend it. It's kind of like a hunger games a little bit. So yeah, that's what I, I was thinking when you were explaining it. Yeah. I really, really enjoyed Not that it. I've seen that either, but no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Kevin and I watched it like the past couple nights. I was up to like one 30 on Sunday and same again last night. Like, just trying to watch as many episodes as I could. The person came- said, because somebody asked, hey, has anybody watched Squid Games? And someone said, yeah, I watched some of it. It's a lot like Alice in Borderland. I don't know what oh, that yeah. is. Yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah, that's another one that's on Netflix. Yeah, very similar to that. Mm-hmm. It's really good. But um, 
like I have noticed that some of my favorite shows like that are like Korean dramas. Like I are like they're like Korean style movies. Yeah. And it's just, it's fascinating. Some of the great shows that come out of there and then like Netflix will get it. And then there'll be a producer in America that's like, I'm going to take that. And then they'll yeah. just westernize it. And it's like something totally different. But if you're, like I said, if you liked, you know, it, it, like the movie Parasite, you know, where it was kind of dark and crazy and wild and over the top, but also really fucking good. This is the same thing. So definitely watch it. It's great. So. That's my, that's my TV I've been watching lately, I think. I had a note, like, what else was I watching? But how was, how was everything? How were all your reality shows? You told me oh yesterday, I think, to tell my dad to watch something. What was it? What show so if it? you watched, um, it's called Prisoner of Love. So mm -hmm. it's kind of like a love off a lockup. And, like, the first, if you watch the Discovery app like I do or you watch TLC, I'm sure you've seen it advertised on there. I don't actually mm -hmm. watch TLC Live, so I don't get promos. It had to pop up on my mm -hmm. app for me to see it. But I started watching the first few episodes, and it's about a woman who runs a matchmaking website for people online. I want to kind of spoil it for you. Shut so I up. Okay, so if you don't want to know, fast forward, because I'm not well, going to watch say, it, and I want you to tell spoil. me. So I get into it, and she, yeah, she sets people up. So here, I'm going to start to kind of spoil it a little bit. Okay. But when I first few episodes, is actually really kind of boring. I was kind of like, yeah, but I was just working, like doing new release shit and pictures, mm -hmm. you know, crap like that. I'll just yeah. play in the background. I'm like, whatever. And the girl that runs it is she's somewhat like when I first get into it, I'm like, she's kind of strange, kind of not, you know, she's like, no, I've never actually like, picked somebody up from prison. I've been more pen pals. But yeah, lately I have been talking to one guy a lot. Mm -hmm. And so you start, she's matching other people up and you're seeing red flags for other shit. But you think, I think she's somewhat normal. Okay. And then like by episode two and three, this bitch starts going down in a fiery ball. What happened? <laughs> I'm Why? Like, what? Like the first guy she's talking to that she's in love with ghost her. Mm -hmm. And then she has to interview other people. And she's like in her 40s, right? Mm -hmm. She starts talking to this young guy who's like buffed up, oh, no. want to be a bodybuilder, trainer, mm -hmm. whatever. And she like seriously starts dating this guy. And red flag one is he's like, he, she's going to go pick him up, right? Okay. And she's like, uh, he's like, I don't know if I want to have sex. Why? What? No. Wow. Mm -mm. <laughs> Something's wrong. <laughs> Something is wrong here. He's using her. Yeah. Oh, for but sure. But anyways, he gets out, they end up doing it, and she is like, you can tell he's a dummy. He's a dummy. Of course he is. <laughs> and, I, and she's just so giddy and in love. This bitch. This bitch. Goes. Why she had to fly out to go see him. Why he gets out. She's got to come back home. Mm -hmm. Goes and gets a giant tattoo of no. his name on her back. You're lying. I am not lying. What's her <laughs> name? Like, What's her name? Someone, like Michael or Mitchell or oh, something. His name? Oh, okay. Wait, she got, wait, she got his name? Mm-hmm. And he got hers. No. And then he like gets on her professional Instagram. He's supposed to get on there. <gasps> and, oh, I'll ask Weird. you. So he got, he's, she has him okay. get on her Facebook or professional mm -hmm. page and starts to interview like he's supposed to tell people what it's like to pen pal with prisoners and they ask okay. questions and he tells them what it's like and how it works mm -hmm. and somebody says to him um well first off when before she left he was like she was like we're exclusive right and he's like yeah he's like I'm good as long as like you know I've cheated a few times when some girls attacked me I was like what no that didn't happen no. that didn't happen <laughs> But anyways, I'm like, happen. okay. He tells her this, like, as they're getting the tattoo, by the way. <laughs> oh, my God. No. So then he, somebody asked him, they're like, so are you taken? And he said, and this is one of their fights, explaining what this means. He was like, I'm lightweight taken. And he's like, that's just like a term. Like, yeah, I'm taken. I'm like, lightweight taken. Doesn't that, no. To me, that sounds like. I can go. I can stay. We're yeah. chilling with this person. Mm -hmm. You know, we're not, not married. Hardcore. Yeah, we're, we're not, not married. hardcore. I don't, yeah, I don't have we're a test in the waters. Commitment. Yeah, but yeah, I have her name tattooed on my body. What a fucking idiot! So then he accidentally logs back into Facebook and he doesn't realize he's on hers at like uh -huh. three in the morning and goes live and he like pisses on camera and she, like on her face. 
Why? Like, he's like drunk. on purpose? He's like drunk oh, and he thinks shit. he's on his own Facebook. Why? It's just a mess. It's just a mess. Oh, that's so sloppy. So you were in it at that point. You're I like, this is my new show. I was kind of really <laughs> bored at first. But then when she started going downhill, I was like, uh-huh. oh, she's she's like the rest. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you're, like, you're like, and I'm in. I've committed to this show now. <laughs> but it was... It was good, but reality TV has been good, but we have a, like the housewives back where like the husbands or people are in jail and crap like that. So, so or going to jail. This is like or, your Super Bowl. It is like a Super Bowl <laughs> right now of the real housewives. It's nice. Oh. All right. So I want to talk about what I read the past couple of days. I'm going to start with one I DNF'd and I am sad to say that I couldn't finish it. But it was, um, it was Christina Lauren's The Unhoneymooners. Mm -hmm. This thing, this book, somebody described it to me and it sounded perfect. I was like, that's exactly what I want to read. Let me just read it like a contemporary romance, like something totally different than what I've been binging lately. And so I was like, okay, let me download this. And so I got the audio and the narrator, like, I don't know what it was. Like, I just could not connect with the narrator. It wasn't that she was bad. It wasn't that she didn't do any. I mean, it wasn't anything she did. It was something about, like, her reading the story. I just couldn't connect with it. I, have you ever had that happen? Where it's not like she was a, she wasn't a bad narrator. It was like, I, it wasn't the voice I pictured with it. So I almost feel like that's my fault, you know? Yeah. But sometimes it just doesn't work. I mean, and I think yeah. sometimes on some level, the voice might remind you of somebody you don't realize it reminds you of. Shit, that's a fair point. Fair so point. You don't realize uh-huh. you connect these things. Like, oh my God, this sounds exactly like my mother. I'm just kidding, mom. I know you're listening. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> but no, like, it, it sucks because this book has hit New York Times like, like four fucking times. Like, this book goes down the charts, then slides right back up. It'll list again, goes back down, comes back up. And it's like everybody who's read it has told me how great it is. Mm -hmm. But, you know, maybe I was just overhyped for it. That happens. That happens. I will say the last Christina Lauren book I read was last year around this time. Yeah. I read the In In a Holidays. Fucking I remember remember you loving it. Loved it. It was such a great concept because it was like Groundhog Day, the movie meets Christmas, like Family Stone. And I was like, this is perfect. This is the Sometimes perfect Sometimes that Christmas happens. Book. So, like, I all know that, like, I'll use, like, this isn't like the person it happened to, but like Aurora yeah. Rose Reynolds. Uh-huh. I could read one of her books and it's just like, it would be okay. But then uh-huh. if you gave it to me as a no name person, uh-huh. I'd be like, oh, this is great. You should check it out because yeah. some authors, have put themselves on a different tier for you. Yeah. So, but yeah, it's just uh-huh. okay. You're like, that didn't work for them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Because yeah. you yeah. can just read this new name. You're like, oh, this is a good author. I like this book. I enjoyed it. But sometimes when there's a name stamped on it, you mm-hmm. have an exception. Like, you're like, this has to be a certain yeah. way. Or you're yeah, going to get like, yeah. it's not enough. Maybe so. You know, the concept is really cute, though. If you haven't read it, it's called um, The Unhoneymooners. It is about this guy and the girl, their enemies, and the girl, her it's her twin sister's wedding day. So her twin sister is getting married to her enemy's brother. So it's like two brothers, two sisters. Mm-hmm. And so they have this seafood buffet, and the girl and the guy, the enemy, don't eat the seafood buffet. She's severely allergic, and he doesn't like buffets because he thinks they're, like, full of germs. The seafood is, like, poisoned. It's not even like a, it's not even like a, like, food poisoning. It's not that it was prepared bad. Like, the seafood, the shellfish itself was bad. Even, like, you could have cooked the shit out of it, and it would still have gotten you sick. Yeah. So, everybody at this wedding, everyone gets sick. And so she won this honeymoon to Hawaii. It was like this incredible, all-inclusive honeymoon. And she's like, her sister's like, you have to take it. Like, you're my twin. You know, they were really specific about nobody could take my place. It had to be me. Like, we're identical. Just take it. And so she goes and she realizes the groom has told his brother, just go in my place. They only asked for a last name for the groom because the girl won it. So he was like, oh, so it's the two of them in this honeymoon suite for 10 days. And so there's a lot of enemy 
before there gets to lover. Yeah. So, and maybe that could have been it too, where I was just, I don't, I love enemies to lover. Like when you've got rivals or like when you're. I like a you know, certain type of enemy. Yeah. I, I like when maybe the I just heroine is enemies. Yes. I don't yes. like when the hero is mm -hmm. enemy. <laughs> I would, I would agree with that assessment as well. But, you know, like typical of a Christina Lauren book, really well written, great characters, beautiful setting. I was into it. And then it was just like the longer it kept going on, I was like, I don't know if I can finish this. But, you know, maybe I should have just tried it in paperback. That's what my friend Shire said the same thing because she, we both listen to audiobooks together. And she's like, I read that one in paperback. You should have done that. I was like, damn you <laughs> for telling me this now. But anyway, so, but I'll, I'll put it out there. If you haven't read it, you definitely should like give that one a go because it's a really cute concept. But um, the other one that I read that I fucking loved, and I have a list, and I'm going to send you this when we're done, just in case. But it's called Love Hypothesis by Allie Hazelwood. I think I have it written down right. Um, Allie, A-L-I. Uh, the Love Hypothesis. I actually saw this as an ad on Instagram for Book of the Month Club. And Book of the Month is like a national thing. You can pay a monthly subscription and then I think you can go in each month and select your titles from like five. Like mm -hmm. there's five different choices and you can select one of that, I think. I, can, I don't know exactly how it works, but the ad was for Book of the Month Club. And the girl was talking about the book she chose from Book of the Month and it's called The Love Hypothesis. And she said that the author who wrote it, wrote it as Raylo fanfic. And for those that don't know, that is from Star Wars. So Adam Driver played Kylo Ren. And there is Ray, like, you know, the, the girl from the newer Star Wars movies. So it's the two of them. She wrote fanfic about them falling in love. So I guess it, this book is based on her fanfic that she wrote. Mm -hmm. So she wrote this story and it's about this girl who is, well, this woman, she's a scientist and she is, um, she's getting her PhD. And so she's working in this lab and one of the like tenure professors there, she's in the hallway with him. This starts out like first page, they're kissing. She just goes up to him and kisses him. So her best friend walks by and like she does it so that her best friend sees her kissing this guy mm -hmm. because she went out with this guy a couple of times. They didn't really have a spark, but she took him to her best friend's birthday party. And the guy and her best friend hit it off. Like, like they were dated so well together. And she's like, I know that my best friend won't date him because I dated him. Mm -hmm. Even though, like, she, they really hit it off. They had a great spark. Like, they, they could really be great together. And she's like, I know she won't do that because I'm single. So she kisses this professor because she told her friend she was on a date. And oh. so her friend sees her in the lab and she's like, what? And so she describes the professor and kisses him like, oh, I was on a date with this professor. And so it ends up being, it is such a good story because you don't realize it. Well, you, you kind of realize it as the book goes, but he has, as he's obsessed with her, for, he's been obsessed with her for like years. He's been obsessed Aww. with her. And so, like, he is so, but he just, I don't know. He acts like um, he he's sort of awkward. Like, he doesn't know what to do, but he's very, like, grouchy and growly and quiet. But he just kind of wants to be with her. But he doesn't want to say that because she's like, well, we're just going to fake date now. Mm -hmm. And so, so my best friend can date my ex-boyfriend and she'll be happy. Like, we're just going to fake date. And he's like, okay, if that's all you want to do. Like, he's, he's just willing to accept yeah. The scraps from this girl. And I'm this book was so fucking charming. It was so cute. Like front to back, the whole book is so, so good. And it's interesting because along as the story goes, there's also this underlying thing about women in STEM, which is like science, technology, engineering, yeah. math. So it's about women in STEM, especially women of color who are not really included in this discussion, yeah. who are like, you know, she's talking about like labs and work and, you know, her education and how when she went to her first day, there was only one other woman in the whole auditorium and they became best friends, you know, and it was like, they just sort of gravitated to each other and her friend is a woman of color. So it's like, they discussed that a lot in the book and it was not over, like it wasn't the point of the book. Like it wasn't, you know, critical to the plot, 
but really as it went, you kind of learned as it went, like what the, the ratio to that is. So it, it was just a really, it, that part was super interesting too, to read about on top of it being an incredible book. Yeah. So it was just like, it was cute as shit. Like there's all these little instances that happen and uh, he said, and I'm obsessed with Adam Driver with Kylo Ren from Star Wars, but Adam <laughs> Driver in particular, because I used to watch the show Girls on HBO and I fucking love him. So he's so awkward and big. I don't, I don't know what it is about him. He's just like perky. awkward and big. Awkward and big. <laughs> I, I know. So the Love Hypothesis by Ali Hazelwood, like definitely check it out. I loved it. It was amazing. So have you read anything recently? Not really. I have like 10 books on here though. When you said that and I pulled up my Kindle, I was like, Jesus, I have a lot of books to read. <laughs> like a bunch of pre-orders that came in and stuff. That's like every single week with me. I'm like, fuck, I got a lot of books to read. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I seen, I pulled up some old Harle Harlequin books. Yes. Like yes. My favorites. Um, we have an author that's coming up in a couple of weeks named Trelina. And um, Trelina Pushy, I think that's how you say her last name, P-U-C-C-I. I'm going to have to ask her just to be sure. But she has a book that's out today, and it's called Just Like Heaven. And she texted me yesterday because we've, like, texted before about, like, like, I wanted to talk to her about something. And she was like, here's my phone number. Just text me. I was like, okay. And so she texted me randomly about something the other day. And then yesterday she called me, and I was like, what are you, what are you calling me for? What's happening here? That's like, weird. Like, like, this is an emergency. <laughs> but, what I, but what I loved is like, she just went for it. Like she wasn't even like, Hey, how are you doing? She was just like, Hey, listen to this. Da, 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 da. <laughs> and like just started talking and she's that. just, she's so cute. Like you, you would love her. But, um, she reminds me a lot of myself, <laughs> but, um, which is why you would obviously love her. But anyway, so she was um, calling me to tell me about, she has a book that's out today. And she's like, I just need to talk to somebody about this that understands what I'm saying. So it's called um, Just Like Heaven. And it's book one in a duet. The second book comes out November 4th. She told me the entire plot to this duet, start to finish. And I was obsessed by the time she got finished telling me this, that I was like, well, I have to buy it now. And she's like, well, it wasn't even like her intent to get me to read this book, but she was just telling me about it because she, she asked a question about something. I was like, well, what's your book about? Like, tell me. And so she started going and it's like um, Leonardo DiCaprio and Claire Danes there, that Romeo and Juliet from like back in the day. Yeah. It's very much like that. So this is a girl that goes to a Catholic prep school super rich she was like these bitches are wearing dior at the lunch table like super rich kind of thing and there's like this family that comes in and takes over this land and the dads like hate each other so like you know it's sort of like guys from the wrong family and they mm -hmm. end up like you know falling for each other yeah and so and it's about like what happens and then there's this huge gigantic cliffhanger she was like i don't even like she was like, I just kick you off a cliff. She was like, you don't even fall. <laughs> so there's this huge cliff anger in book, book one, but the second one's so close. And I know what happens in the second one. I was like, okay, I'm definitely going to read this. But the lengths that this guy goes to, to be with her, it's, he's crazy. I love and I was that. Like, I, ha I was like, I have to fucking read this. And she was like, because she was telling me everything. I was like, this sounds insane. And she was like, yeah. She said, I really just fucking went for it. Because she's like, I knew if I wanted to read something that was super, like, dramatic and cracky and over the top. Yeah. She's like, of course, if I wanted to read this, like, somebody else would want to read it. For but, sure. So I started it today. And I think I'm on, like, chapter two or three. And I'm, like, reading it because it's not an audio. So you know it has to be a good one. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like actually like a pilgrim. I'm reading it. And um it's so good. Like even from the jump, I'm like, what the fuck's happening? Where <laughs> who is this guy? What's going on? So I'm really excited about that one too. So that's my other that's my current book news that I'm in right now. So um I don't know. I have more stuff to talk about. We can save it or we can do it now. I, I don't let's know. Save it. Okay, let's, we, I, let's talk about out. Let's talk about A.M. Johnson for a little bit before I before I get to step in too much on all the other shit I want to talk about today. Um, I'll read you her, her book bio and her author bio and all that good stuff. Like I said, we're playing you the first installment of Into Elysium. But A.M. Johnson has a beautiful website, by the way. It's super pretty. It's amjohnsonauthor.com. 
And, oh, okay, she says her name's Amanda in her book bio. I didn't want to call her that in case she was like, don't say my name. So it says it in her book bio. It says, Amanda is an award-winning and best-selling author of LGBTQIA in contemporary romance and fiction. She lives in Utah with her family, where she moonlights as a nurse on the weekends and hikes in the mountains as much as possible. If she's not busy with her three munchkins, you'll find her buried in a book or behind the keyboard where she explores the human experience through the written word, exploring all spectrums and genres. She's obsessed with all things hockey, Austin, and Oreos, and loves to connect with readers. So she sounds busy. busy. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> She's got a lot going on. <laughs> she has a, a For Him series. There's three books in that one. Um, book one is called Love Always Wild, and it has 457 five stars. Damn. I know. I was like, what the fuck? <laughs> that is amazing. So um, she did say she's giving away her giveaway this week is a signed paperback of Dear Mr. Body, which is in that series, I believe. I think she had it all on there. But um, like I said, Into Elysium is what we're doing today. I'll read you that book bio and then I can tell you a little bit more. But um, let's see. Evan had one job in, at Elysium. Keep the barrier wall lit at all costs. As a dust guard, he was safe from the war raging across the country from the rebels in the New World, safe from the battle over power, water, and electricity. He was safe from the laws that would see him dead if they knew his one secret. But when he's called it inside Elysium to watch over one of the rebel prisoners, every wall he'd created to protect himself comes tumbling down. Kale never thought he'd survive the virus that had turned the world dark and had flipped his country upside down. He never thought his last days would be drawn out inside a cell in one of the most notorious prisons in the West. Elysium was the place for the dead, but in the pitch of night, the one person he thought he couldn't trust becomes his savior and so much more. Into Elysium is a male-male, dystopian, enemies-to-lovers short story with heart, heat, and suspense. Dear Mr. Body releases on August 5th. It's super sweet, light, fun read. It's the third book in her For Him series, and it can be read as a standalone. So she's giving away a signed paperback copy of that. Um, Dear Mr. Body is interconnected, standalone, contemporary, male, male, slow burn romance that is light on angst and features dating app shenanigans, student professor fraternization, single dad swoonery, waffles, Peter Pan references, and a fish named Tony. Damn. She like, I love Got this. This is great. So, um, let's see. Oh, she has an also has a new audio book coming out, a not so sincerely yours on October 19th. It's narrated by Kurt Graves and Tim Page. And this book is number is the two number two in the For Him series. So that's coming out on Audible or an audio on October 19th. So that should be out in a couple weeks. So so be sure and check that out. Make sure you enter her giveaway and We'll play the first installment now for Intel Elysium. I guess see you on the other side. Bye. Bye. This is Into Elysium, a short story by A.M. Johnson, read to you by Joshua McRae. Chapter One Eben. As one of the five dusk guards, I walked the perimeter of Elysium, soaking and lighting the logs inside the large metal lanterns situated along the path. The bright beacons, our only source of light at night, since the world had gone dark six months ago. The kerosene burned the tips of my fingers as it seeped into the small cuts in my skin. I lived in the guard camp south of the prison and worked every other evening. Each shift started with the lanterns. Then, clearing the trash from the daily windstorms, and if I was lucky, by midnight, I'd have enough time to eat before checking the fires all over again. It was monotonous, lonely work, but lately the isolation was welcome. The longer I was stationed here, the harder it was to hide the truth. I would have preferred working West Camp, but men were not allowed to work the women's prisons anymore. The northern militias were known for their brutal behaviors. Rape and polygamy had run rampant for months after the U.S. military fell to the so-called freedom fighters. Women were not safe from men. Not anymore. Maybe they never were in the first place. But me. My kind. If anyone found out about my predilections for men, 
I'd be hanged in the street and used as an example. Too many things had changed. The world as I'd known it was gone, and it had only gotten worse over the last year. We had no real understanding of how it all had happened. The virus, the wars, the shifts in power. The weak veil of democracy fell as fast as the people died in their beds from fever. And when we all lost electricity, the last shred of humanity we'd been holding on to vanished along with it. There were no more hospitals, no more cars, no more easy communication. All that was left was war, uncertainty, and a fight to simply exist. The things I had seen and done. I was only 25 years old, but it was as if death was a shadow I couldn't shake. I'd survived the pandemic, but I had been wounded. According to the militia doctors, my lungs were too weak to fight in their war. And what I first thought was a blessing became my curse. I was stuck here, surrounded by temptation and death and pain. Eben. Doral called out my name, out of breath as he ran toward me. He handed me a small brown bag, the bottom wet and torn as he set it in my hand. A sour smell filled the air. Captain said you're to report for guard duty in the East Sector. But I've just finished the lamps. What about... You are going to argue. He raised his brow as a dangerous smirk lit his features. Shorter than me, with an ugly, paunchy stomach that hung over his belt, he rolled his shoulders and stretched as tall as he could manage. I've been called up to the Boulder Front. Said they grabbed about a dozen NEA fighters. Some of them women. The way he licked his lips, the scent emanating from the bag wasn't the only thing making my gut churn. I leave in 20. Get your ass to the East Sector. Captain doesn't like to wait. What's this bag for? I asked, and he laughed. That's for Prisoner 192. A gift for his good behavior. Doral's jaw pulsed. Make sure he gets it. I made my way toward the front gate, trying my best to ignore the stench. Some of the other dusk guards gave me pitiful glances as I passed by. Working the perimeter was a highly coveted position. No one wanted to work the halls of Elysium. It was easy to see your own reflection in the face of the prisoners. We were all one accusation away from sharing a cell with those we guarded. Once inside, there was always a chance you'd never leave. Experience had taught me that. The iron bars echoed as they closed behind me, each door heavier than the last. The deeper into the labyrinth, the darker it got. The East Sector was for the worst offenders. The leaders and officers of the NEA, North Essential Army. Traitors of the state. The rebels. The darkness here was like a lead weight. It didn't budge. It laid like a blanket, suffocating and overly warm. Those who join the NEA are destined to die. My father had said to me before he'd gone to the Boulder Front in Colorado to fight with the Freedom Militia. He died two weeks later. Hung by his own commanding officer for refusing to take part in the punishment of a woman prisoner. My mother had already succumbed to the virus by the time the word of his death found its way back to our small encampment south of Salt Lake. That was the day I was sent here, sent into Elysium, a prisoner for two months before I was pardoned for my father's crimes and given the position of dusk guard. Another small mercy. Eben, what took you so long? Captain stepped from the shadows and handed me his candle. The smell of body odor and piss assaulted me, reminding me how close I'd come to this very fate, caged like an animal for life. Get lost in the dark, he laughed. Nah, you're familiar with the ins and outs of this place, aren't you? Never in this deep, though. Lucky for you. You had a forgiving judge. I placed the candle in the metal holder attached to the stone wall. 
I'm grateful to serve the Freedom Militia, sir, any way I can. Grateful, he asked, exposing his gray teeth with a sneer. Grateful and lucky are not the same thing. Watch yourself, or you'll wind up back behind bars. He nodded to the package in my hand. Down there, third cell on the left. I nodded. Thank you. He grunted before lighting another candle. I'll be back in a couple of hours. Round hall A, B, and C until I get back. Not too many prisoners in the East Sector. Shouldn't be too hard. Yes, sir. Relieved, I exhaled a weary breath when Captain disappeared into the darkness of the stairwell. With the stinking bag in my hand, I followed the low light down to 192's cell. The light was virtually non-existent this far down the hall, and when I approached the small chamber door, I couldn't see anyone inside. Hello, I asked, and a loud scuffled noise made me jump. Stand where I can see you, 192. I waited, and he did not appear. Doral said to give this to you, that you earned it for good behavior. Come into the light. Another shift and scrape, and when I thought he wouldn't show his face, a pair of icy blue eyes pierced through the darkness. His hair was inked black, his skin pale. The lines of his nose and jaw sharp and delicate. He was painfully beautiful, even in here, in Elysium, where men come to die. Kale. Every step I took hurt. My bones ached and my muscles pinched. Thirty days, or was it thirty-two, I'd lost count. There was no daylight this deep into Elysium. Only candles when the guards were gracious. Who are you? I asked without regard for my own safety. Elysium, according to the old Greek myths, was a place of peaceful death. The irony was not lost on me. There was no peace in death here. Only days that stretched forever into nights that wouldn't end. I'd beg for death, but in doing so, I'd only prolong my suffering. Begging for death only is sure to torturous and long life. Eben, but it shouldn't matter to you. His eyes were warm and brown, almost soft and benevolent in the low candlelight. A perfect deceit. Kindness did not exist here. Take this, he said. His voice was gruff as he shoved the bag he'd been holding through the cell bars. When I didn't reach for it, Eben sighed. I won't hurt you, he whispered and leaned in. I'm, I'm not like the others. I'm a dusk guard. I didn't know what the difference was between him and the likes of Doral, but I didn't care. A guard. Nevertheless, Eben pulled his hand back and opened the bag. His face contorted as he retched. What the hell? The bag fell and hit the ground with a quiet, wet thud. Why would they send you rotten apples? He asked as he wiped his hands on his pants. I couldn't find it in me to laugh at his naivete. My family used to own an orchard in Vermont before everything. The militia killed my father and sold my mother to one of the officers. But they said you've been good, and... He ran a big hand over his shaved head. I didn't know. As if that excused it. Now you do. I stepped back into the shadow and waited for him to leave. Eben stood still, staring into the cell like he could see me, see my eyes, like he understood. What's your name? He whispered. I almost quoted the number given to me by the prison, 
but there was some unnerving feeling twisting around inside my stomach, and I spoke without thinking. Kale. I'm sorry, Kale. Kale. The sound of my name, sad and deep on his lips, made my hands shake. It was too human, too real, too palpable. After a minute of silence, he walked away. This had to be a test. Doral had sent Eben as a test. Did they know about me? Surely they'd have executed me by now if they knew. Maybe I should have told them. Told them that I'd had a boyfriend once. A man not unlike Eben. Tall and muscled and tan and sweet. I should have told them about Seven. Told them how he used to fuck me in the orchard house my father and I had built with our own hands. The same one they'd burned down the day they sold my mother. Maybe then I'd get the peaceful death promised to me. Fast and easy. Every day I was dying, but they'd draw it out. That was the whole point. I'm not sorry. I said to the darkness before I lay down onto the hard pallet, covered in hay like a pig in a barn, and fell asleep, dreaming of cider and cinnamon. Hey. Drowsy, I sat up, the pain along my spine hardly bearable. Are you awake? Eben asked. He held a candle in one hand and an apple in the other. With the light close to his face, I could see how handsome he was. He had a strong chin with a dimple in the middle, his skin a deeper brown than the sun could create on its own. The hair on his head was clipped short like the other guards, the protection against lice. The prisoners were not afforded such a luxury. But it was the wrinkles around his eyes I liked the most, a mark of happiness lost. No one smiled enough for laugh lines anymore. Maybe in another life he was good. Still, I didn't trust him. This is for you. He held up a shiny red apple. Why? I sat unmoving. I don't need it. I packed too much to eat and you look hungry. Too much food. That was a lie. Everyone was rationed. Why do you care if I'm hungry? I'm a traitor, haven't you heard? I rubbed the back of my neck. The headache I had earlier resurfaced. The apple in his hand tempted me. I'd only had a bowl of broth for breakfast and a small piece of bread. My suspicion kept me seated. How do I know you won't say I stole it? His lips broke into a small, almost friendly smile. Steal it. How would you manage that from in there? He was mocking me. Keep the fucking apple. I don't need your charity. His lips flattened into a thin line. You should watch your mouth. I managed to smirk. Don't you have rounds to do? He leaned down and set the apple on the concrete floor just inside the cell door. The light of the candle trickled across the small space, and it was then I saw the small tattoo on his wrist. I stared at the numbers on my own wrist. 192. You were a prisoner, I asked before I could stop myself. Eben stood, pulling the sleeve of his uniform down. His eyes met mine, the rise and fall of his chest faster and faster with each passing second. Eat the apple. Take the small mercies. His throat bobbed as he stepped back. We've all lost something. What had he lost? Why had he been imprisoned? How did he get out? Tell me, I said, and stood on wobbling legs. He turned to look down the hall and then settled his eyes on my face. I was a traitor, too, but I was pardoned. How, I asked, impulsive and eager. If I could get out of here, if I could make it back to the front. Everything I had was gone. My family, seven. 
But if I could fight, if I could find a way back to the way things used to be, hope was a dangerous drug. I was punished for something my dad had done, and the judge hearing my case, he was kind, said I'd suffered enough, and my imprisonment would do nothing for the Constitution. He made me a guard. They own me, but I live. I breathe. Eben spoke in fast, whispered sentences. Are you NEA? He shook his head. No. Hope drained from my limbs, and I couldn't find the strength to continue standing. I sank to my knees, my eyes on the apple. I wouldn't eat it. I wouldn't be bought. Chapter 2 Kale Every day for three weeks, he'd set an apple outside my cell door. Doral had not returned, and every night Eben stood watch. At first, he'd offered me no words, just that fucking apple. I thought it was a taunt, another game to amuse the well-fed kings of Elysium. But after the fourth night, when Eben had stared into the darkness of my cell with disappointment hanging in his limbs, and said, Please, eat something. I'd started to believe he might actually care. Had he offered gifts to everyone, Nothing in this world was without motive. Nothing was given for free. Nothing was given with love. The other two prisoners in my hall had been executed this week, and I wondered what they'd been accused of. Did they get caught accepting one of Evan's gifts? How many others still drew breath inside these walls? How long would it be before my own lungs stopped? The silence that had come with their death bit at my ears, while the pitch-black air suffocated my lungs. I sat with my back against the cold stone wall and stared at the apple I wouldn't eat, wishing for and dreading Eben's next round. As hard as I'd tried to convince myself that I didn't want or need his attention, I was relieved when he showed up every day. My stomach growled as I watched a rat sneak across the floor toward the apple. Sneaky. It sniffed, then circled the fruit before nibbling away at the pink skin. A chuckle escaped me. At least one of us will go to bed with a full belly. Why won't you eat? Eben asked, his thick, rich voice filling the vacant space of my cell, and the rat scampered into the black hall. The candle Eben held flickered, Casting odd shadows across the floor, his warm eyes narrowed, seeking me out. I didn't move. Why should I eat while others suffer? He exhaled and leaned his tall, broad frame against the cell door. You think others would not eat if offered the same opportunity? It's not my business what other people do. It's your business to survive, he said his irritation leaking into his words. I do not wish to live. Why not offer me death instead of useless fruit? I licked my dry lips. Your apple would only prolong my torment. How old are you? He asked. Why does it matter? Eben ran his hand over his head and started to walk away. Twenty-four, I blurted and regretted my desperate tone. He held a power over me that I hadn't planned to give him. You. He set the candle onto the wall sconce, making it difficult to see his face. Despite my reservations, I'd come to trust his eyes. Twenty-five. He seemed older, tired. A small sigh parted his lips. They told me you're not eating in the mornings. I have broth. That's not enough to... What about the men who were executed? What about the men in the other halls? What compassion have you offered them? I asked. My ire stole my breath and twisted it into a sharp, painful cough. My ribs strained with the movement, 
and the ache of it radiated through my bones. He pressed his forehead against the bars and closed his eyes. Eben's fingers curled around the metal as if he had to hold himself up. I can't change the way things are. I can only do what I can. He whispered, and the defeat in his voice, in his posture, had an unwelcome guilt pooling in my stomach. Don't waste your kindness on me. I'm already dead. I... Eben turned to look down the hall before he whispered. The boulder front is falling. What? I asked, my heart in my throat. How do you know that? Doral, he wasn't allowed to come back. They need as many men as possible. If this was true, the thought made me dizzy. You're lying. I'm not. I sent three more guards this afternoon. That's why I haven't returned to my post as a dust guard. It's why... He took a few slow breaths, and when he spoke again, the disgust in his voice was the most honest thing I'd heard in months. It's why they executed the two men in your hall, and another four in the West Sector. There aren't enough guards, and too many prisoners. For the first time, death terrified me. I didn't want to be disposed of, not when the front was falling, not if there was actually something left to fight for. Why would you tell me this? They will hang you if they... I'll die here or on the front. You'd fight with them, I accused, and held my breath. His answer shouldn't mean the world, but it did. I wanted to believe in those truthful brown eyes. I needed something to hold on to, some bit of decency, some scrap of hope I thought I'd lost. He shook his head. No, I wouldn't. It took some effort, but I stood. Eben stared as I moved closer to the cell door. Would you fight against them? I was close enough I could smell the soap on his skin, cedar and lye, as I wrapped my fist around the iron bar below his hand. The heat of his body drew me in. A small fraction of his skin brushed along the edge of my finger and I shivered. The muscle of his jaw feathered beneath his tan skin. If Abel, I would. Abel, I asked, my eyes trailing over his wide chest and muscled arms. You seem able enough to me. Eben's grin was crooked, the easy curve of his lips reminding me of an easier time, a time when the very thought of kissing his smile wouldn't have landed me in a pyre. The virus, it scarred my lungs. Never judge a book by its cover. Exactly. A laugh scratched in my throat, and it echoed through the darkness. My eyes widened, and I covered my mouth with my hand, shocked at the loud sound of it. I couldn't remember the last time I had truly laughed. Evan let go of the bars and stepped back. We both stood like statues, waiting to be discovered. Seconds ticked by and the fast-moving heat bloomed along my spine, over my chest and face, as Eben held my gaze. Gail. I don't think they heard us, I interrupted, and stumbled back. A man hadn't looked at me like that since seven. It frightened as much as it thrilled me. Yesterday, I would have entertained the idea. Hitting on a guard would be the quickest path to death there was too much to lose now. If the front was about to fall, if there was a way to win back the Constitution, I had to think with my head and not my heart. Eben. Don't be afraid, I said. The panic in his clear blue eyes threatened to steal the last vestiges of heat from my skin. The ghost of his touch on my finger remained even in the cold black night of Elysium. You were the only one left. I don't understand. His brows furrowed, but he didn't retreat any farther. 
This hall is empty. You're the only one here. Kale's head tipped back as he closed his eyes. There's no time, then. I couldn't stop myself from staring at the smooth, pale silhouette of his neck. I wanted to blame the isolation of this place for my fascination with Kale. Every day I spent inside these walls was another day I offered up a piece of my soul. The men here were underfed and sick, skin hanging on bones, dirt and sweat and excrement, the scent of death. The minute I stepped inside, the fog of desperation nearly drowned me. But Kale was a flicker of light in the middle of the misery. He wanted to pretend like he'd accepted his end, but the fight that radiated from him day in and day out called to me. Captain left for the front this morning. All executions have been stayed. For now. He opened his eyes and caught me staring. Do you know when he's to return? I shook my head. No one does. Who's in charge now? Lux. He winced. That's even worse. Kale ran a shaky hand through his hair, and my eyes followed the movement. He was weaker than I thought. You need to eat, I said, as more of an order than a suggestion. Did you mean it? What you said? He moved toward the cell door and grabbed the iron bars again with both of his hands. If able, would you fight? Yes. I took a step closer, taking in as much of his face as I could. Then I'll eat. He was too thin, and could use a shower or two. But even so, he was perfect. I could only imagine what Kay would look like in the sun, if his dark hair would shine under natural light. If those cunning eyes would see right through me, would he be able to see it? See the attraction I had for him? Too much time had passed since I'd been physical with anyone. It was too dangerous. But it didn't matter. In the sun, I'd find my wits and realize I could never have a man like Gale. Not anymore. There are other ways to fight, Eben. He pressed his long body against the bars, his face close enough to touch, and for a small moment, when his gaze found my mouth, I thought maybe he wanted me too. But you already know that. I don't. I don't know how. My pulse thudded in my throat. Talking about any of this was treason. I'm not like you. Aren't you? The apple, Eben? Kindness? Hope? It's how we'll take it all back. Lux was at the front gate the next evening when I arrived. Sweat broke out across my brow as I made my way up the path. Trying to distract myself from the fear cooling inside my veins, I watched the dusk guards light the first few lamps. Eben, come with me. His command was clipped as he turned on his heel. The soup and bread I'd had earlier turned rancid in my stomach. Had he found out about what Kale and I had talked about last night? Had someone heard? My heart dropped into my stomach. Last night, after every round, I'd find my way back to cell 192. Kale had opened up a little more, even ate half of my sandwich while he asked about my life in Salt Lake. I shouldn't have let him in, shouldn't have allowed myself to care. And they executed him. The thought brought bile to the back of my throat. If he had died because of my own selfishness, then I'd braid my own noose. Lux led me deep into Elysium, past A, B, and C Hall to the officers' quarters. The air was stagnant and still as he shut the door behind me. Have a seat, he said, his dark black eyes boring through me. I swallowed. Heavy and dry. 
Is something wrong? Lux sat behind his desk and steepled his fingers. I'm afraid so. The sprint of my pulse burned in my side like a runner's cramp as I waited for him to speak, his shrewd appraisal deafening. Captain Doral, along with the small regiment we sent last Friday, have all perished, ambushed. He slammed the palm of his hand on his desk and I jumped. Motherfucking NEA. I lowered my eyes, focusing on my lap instead of the angry slit of his lips. Lux was older, his face distorted with multiple scars. He'd fought in several of the wars I'd learned about in high school when I was a kid. He was hateful in a way that made even the most confident men piss their pants. When he was ordered to execute a prisoner, he'd take the whole day, take his time. He was known for his inhumane tortures. If it was up to them, we'd abandoned God's will, equal rights. He scoffed. If God wanted everyone to be equal, don't you think he would have made us all the same? Fucking rebels and their cock-sucking president. It's disgusting the way he parades around with his so-called husband. When we take the North, we'll gut them both. My head snapped up, terror and surprise warring inside me. I knew little about the NEA and their president. When everything went dark, any news I'd had about the rest of the country faded into the propaganda served to me by our commanders and city leaders. The entirety of my existence had been reduced to a 20-mile radius, the guard encampment, and Elysium. I never questioned it, never wondered. My father dared to question, and now he was worm's meat. He sleeps with men, I asked, with feigned judgment. Lux laughed without humor. I forget how ignorant you guards can be. Our country, this freedom you enjoy, dangles from the tip of a knife. If the NEA takes Boulder, he clenched his jaw. Daggart and Liam have been dispatched to the front, and you'll leave in a month with the 440. Sir, I can't. You can, and you will. We need bodies on the front line. I have a medical waiver. Front line? I'd be dead by end of day. Lux scowled, his irritation more fury as he balled his hands into fists. Medical waiver or not, you will fight for your constitution. Die for it if you have to. What about Elysium? Who will guard the prisoners? Prisoners are of no consequence. He signed a piece of paper and handed it to me. They will be given the option to fight. If they refuse before the last regiment is sent out, they'll be executed. An image of Kale, his blue eyes dim and lifeless, took my breath away. All of them. East Sector was small compared to the rest of Elysium. It was why only one guard was needed to man it, but there were at least a hundred prisoners housed inside the rest of these stone walls. If they won't fight, then they're taking resources we need from the front, food from our soldiers' mouths. Fight or die, the same goes for you, Eben. He handed me the paper he had signed, my official deployment orders. You have no choice. He was wrong. I had a choice. I could run. And I knew Kale would run with me. Chapter 3 Kale The day guard paced the hall, wringing his hands as he waited for Eben to relieve him. I guess even the guards were afraid to be forgotten here. A loud, familiar echo boomed through the hall. The guards sighed and stormed toward the iron gates. I sat on the cold floor, anxious to see his face. After Eben opened up to me last night, something between us had shifted. Under his light, 
I was no longer a prisoner. I was a friend? The word didn't feel enough. Maybe the intel he'd given me meant nothing. Maybe it had been a way for him to get close to someone. The loneliness in his eyes was easy to see. The loneliness of this place was a chill not many could shake. But what if we'd stayed like this? What if nothing ever changed? Him on one side and I on the other. The trust I'd had for him bloomed beneath my skin, and I couldn't stop the roots from sinking into my chest. I wanted more. I wanted to know what he was like before Elysium, before the pandemic. I wanted to sit as his equal, at a bar or a diner, sipping coffee or beer and smile, knowing that once we left, the night would only get better. The thought was painful. Those days were gone. My heartbeat matched the sound of heavy footfall as it neared my cell door. An orange glow crept along the wall, and I closed my eyes, praying to a god I didn't believe in anymore that it wasn't a stranger, that Eben hadn't been sent away to. Kale, he whispered, and I smiled. I reached up and touched my lips. The rarity of relief spread through my limbs as I stood. I'm here, I said, and walked to the cell door. Why were you late? He handed me an apple and I took a bite, the sweet juice almost too much. Lux. He shifted the candle in his hand, illuminating his features in a way I hadn't seen before. This close, I could see the lack of sleep around his eyes, the weariness, the fear. I'm being deployed. When? My voice cracked and the apple fell from my hand. A month. Maybe I'd be dead in a month. Maybe I'd be free. But at least I wouldn't be alone. Not yet. A lot could happen in a month, I said. The militia could fail. The NEA could take control. Shh, he hissed, his eyes wide as he turned to look down the hall. Captain. Doro. They're dead. Dead? He swallowed and nodded. Lux is sending as many men as he can. Eben's eyes locked on mine. If the prisoners refuse to fight with the militia, refuse to join them, they'll be killed. My spine straightened. Anger boiled inside of me. I'd rather die an honorable death than spend one minute in a traitor's army. I'm not asking you to fight. Then you're here to kill me. My voice did not waver this time. Eben clenched his jaw and shook his head. No, I'm here to offer you a third option. And what's that? Run. With me. The roots in my chest spread to my heart. Eben, I... Think about it. We have a few weeks to make a plan. I can gather supplies, store my rations, and... Eben. Kale, I know it might. I'll run with you, Eben. I'll fight with you. Oh, okay. He rubbed at the center of his chest. Okay. We were quiet, offering the silence our breath as we stood like ghosts. We had both died here tonight. The men we used to be, reborn again inside this small moment, inside a promise. It felt like hope. Evan moved, or maybe it was me. It didn't matter once his trembling fingers were entwined with mine. The warmth of his skin sent a shock up my arm. Linked between the barrier of my cell, as if the cold iron bars didn't exist for us. I don't know what I'm doing. He said, his eyes falling to my mouth. I sucked in a breath as I squeezed his hand. The right thing. What about the others? 
His Adam's apple moves slow and hard. It's like you said. What kindness have I shown them? We can make a plan. Save as many men as possible. I only have keys for the East Sector. He reached for the bar with his left hand and rested his forehead against the door. His eyes closed and I wanted to touch his face. The heat of his breath brushed my cheek. Then we'll do what we can. I squeezed Eben's hand and he opened his eyes. This close, even with little light, the tiny specks of gold inside his dark brown irises revealed themselves to me. His lashes were thick and long and blinked back at me with a mix of desire and hesitation. Or perhaps I was projecting. But he didn't let go of my hand or look away. He held me in this limbo where the air between us crackled with everything we both refused to say. I want you. Is this what you want? Don't be afraid. Kiss me. I brought you something, he said, and I exhaled. He let go of my hand and I rolled my fingers into a fist to conserve his heat. Eben pulled a small parcel from his pocket and handed it to me. He'd wrapped his gift in an old newspaper, and I stared at the worn words. Well, open it, he said, a smile on his lips. I might have stolen a few of the items, but I figured it was worth it. It. Me. I was worth it. I ripped through the paper and chuckled at the contents. Are you trying to tell me something? He rubbed at the back of his neck. It's not right, the way they treat prisoners. I wanted you to feel more, I don't know, human, I guess. Human, I whispered. The baking soda works like toothpaste when it's wet, and if you chew the mint leaves when you're done, it kills the aftertaste. I sniffed the small piece of soap, cedar and lye just like Eben. My throat ached and I could barely speak. Thank you. Eben. He lowered his eyes, trying to hide the unshed tears I hadn't missed. Kale rubbed the soap with the pad of his thumb, his fingers long and fragile. He swallowed and breathed and swallowed again. Before everything, he said. My mother used to grow mint leaves in her garden. She said it kept the spiders away. Kale's lips broke into a sad smile. Was it true? I think so. He lifted his gaze. His smile was gone, replaced with trembling lips. My, my. Kale sighed and shook his head. Tell me, I urged. He looked down at the small gifts and back at me. My boyfriend found a spider web once, near one of her plants. So maybe it wasn't true. Boyfriend. I schooled my features, trying for a calm I couldn't maintain. Boyfriend. The need I thought I'd seen in his eyes earlier, had I not imagined it. What happened to him? Dear boyfriend. He's dead. I, I'm sorry. He searched my face. The virus. When Seven died, I thought it was so unfair. But now I realize he was the lucky one. Sometimes I wish I would have died. I wish my lungs would have given out. Sometimes, he asked as I stepped closer. There were times I didn't think I could make it through any more pain. I smoothed the tip of my finger over the tattooed number on my wrist. If you were dead, you wouldn't be here. Kale gripped the bar. And if you were dead, I might be too. Is it selfish for me to think that? No. My hand shook as I lifted it to his face. 
He leaned into my palm, his eyes on mine. I'm selfish too, I said, barely able to catch my breath as I moved my hand to his waist. Come here. The bars between us made it next to impossible, but as my lips pressed against his, I could pretend we were someplace else. He reached through the bar and grasped my shirt, pulling me as close as he could. Kale's lips were soft and willing, and I would have taken a bullet right then if it meant I could die feeling like this. Alive and warm and free. He licked my lips and I opened for him, tasting the apple from earlier on his tongue. I tugged at the loop on his pants and he groaned. Breathless, we broke apart, the dark and dank surroundings a slap in the face. I shoved away from his cell, my heart tripping over itself as I looked around. And we were alone. I, I'm sorry. Don't be. Gail's cheeks were pink, his chest heaving as he touched his bottom lip. We have to be careful. If anyone had seen, I wasn't thinking. It's been too long. He finished for me. I dared to close the distance between us again, his kiss still burning my lips, and I took his hand in mine. I've wanted to do that since the first night I saw you. We have to get out of here, he said, his thumb trailing back and forth inside my palm. We will, I promise you. I'll do whatever I can. I didn't know what I was to him. A ticket out, a person to trust but he was important to me. There wasn't shit left in this world to fight for, but I found myself desperately wanting to fight for him. Welcome back. Hey, thanks for coming back with us. Um, we're super excited to play that for you. So make sure you enter to win this week's giveaway. Follow out her good stuff. Check out her For Him series. And like I said, that uh, Mr. Body that you can be read as a standalone, that's the one that's coming out that released on August 5th. That's her most recent release. So make sure you check that out. All right. Tell them what to do. Fuck your day up. Make sure your bitch. Don't be a dick. Bye, guys. Bye. Read me romance. Read, read me romance. Read me romance. Read, read me romance. You could take a look in a book, that's fine Or you could sit back, relax, and unwind And read me romance Read, read me romance